Euh, Bessane Fanali est une poétesse et prosatrice américaine, poète lauréate de l'État du Mississippi. Elle est née dans le New Jersey et a grandi à Lake Forest dans l'Illinois. Elle vit aujourd'hui à Oxford, dans le Mississippi, avec sa famille, où elle enseigne euh, à l'université la création littéraire, et plus particulièrement la poésie et la non-fiction, non-fiction. Je garde le terme américain parce qu'il y a... Mais franchement, j'ai réfléchi, mais on ne peut pas trouver de terme plus précis euh, euh, et parfait que « non-fiction ». Son enseignement a été d'ailleurs récompensé à, à plusieurs reprises. Bess Anne a écrit six livres, trois recueils de poèmes, euh, je citerai euh, « Unmentionable » en 2008, où l'auteur explore avec des jeux de mots élégants et un esprit subversif l'inavouable, non seulement ce qui est considéré comme déplacé, tabou, mais aussi ce qui ne peut pas être dit parce que les mots sont insuffisants. Ces trois recueils sont publiés chez Norton. Elle a également publié un livre de non-fiction, non-fiction, uh, Great with Child, Letters to a Young Mother, un roman, The Tilted World, qu'elle a coécrit avec son mari, l'écrivain Tom Franklin, publié en 2013 par Harper Collins. Ce roman a été traduit dans plusieurs langues, dont le français, et publié chez Alba Michel sous le titre « Dans la colère du fleuve ». C'est un grand roman du Sud américain dont l'action se déroule pendant la crise, la crue historique de, du Mississippi, euh, du fleuve, donc en 1927. Une histoire extraordinaire de meurtre et d'alcool de contrebande, de sacs de sable et de saboteurs, et d'un homme et d'une femme qui trouvent l'amour d'une manière tout à fait inattendue. Et plus récemment, une collection de « micro-mémoires » qu'on pourrait aussi appeler en français « micro-récits autobiographiques ».« Heating and Cooling, 52 micro-mémoires », également publié par W.W. Norton. C'est un livre inclassable, 52 histoires courtes, qui offre une esquisse lumineuse d'une vie bien vécue et qui combine dans sa forme la fusion de la poésie avec la vérité de l'autobiographie, et qui donne un livre sincère et festif. La poésie de Bess Anne a été publiée dans plus de 50 anthologies, y compris dans The Best American Poetry. Elle a publié de nombreux essais et remporté plusieurs prix pour ceux-ci. Voilà, Bess Anne. Thank you so much, Sophie, and um, thank you all for being here in this terrible weather. I think anyone who came out tonight deserves a prize, so many thanks. Um, I'm just very happy to be here at this beautiful house and in your beautiful town. I thought I'd read to you a little bit from the book. Sophie talked about micro-memoirs. So if you don't know that word, um, I think I made it up. But the reason why I wrote this is the book I published before, as Sophie mentioned in her introduction, is a novel that I wrote with my husband. We collaborated on it. And it was a historical novel set in the flood of the Mississippi River uh, during Prohibition time in 1927. And we had to do a lot of research to write this novel. It actually took us four years working together, and we did it and stayed married. So, you know, it was great, but it was very high stakes. If that novel had failed, it would have been a tough time in our little house. So afterwards, um, I thought I'd write my own novel, but when I went to my notebook, I was just, I couldn't get anything started. I was just writing down weird little thoughts or um, funny memories. I was frustrated because I wasn't writing, except I was having fun. And I've learned as I've gotten older to trust fun. So I just kept doing it. And then I thought, what if these aren't going to add up to something bigger? What if they're their own size, the right size? So I thought of the term micro memoirs. Um, I'm going to read you a couple. I'll start with the first one. Married love. In every book my husband's written, a character named Colin suffers a horrible death. This is because my boyfriend, before I met my husband, was named Colin. In addition to being named Colin, he was Scottish and an architect. So you understand my husband's feelings of inadequacy. My husband cannot build a tall building of many stories. He can only build a story and then push Colin out of it. <laughs> 
So one thing that I did in this book that was really fun for me um, was I wrote one sentence pieces. You know, after the high stakes project of the novel, it was so nice to just um, free yourself to fail with something one sentence long. So I thought I'd read a couple of those. I'll read three. Um, the first one was Married Love. This is also from the sequence in here, Married Love, Married Love 2. There will come a day, let it be many years from now, when our children realize no married couple ever needed to retreat at high noon behind a locked bedroom door to discuss taxes. Married Love 4. Morning. Bought a bag of frozen peas to numb my husband's sore testicles after his vasectomy. Evening. Added thawed peas to our pasta carbonara. <laughs> He's at home right now with our three kids, and I'm here reading all this terrible stuff. <clears throat> um, we've been talking a lot about foxes, actually. Um, there, I've never been in a place with so many foxes as you have here. It's wonderful to see them in the fields. And um, uh, several of my fellow um, residents here have foxes as a spirit animal or um, a special connection with foxes. So I thought I would read um, a piece about foxes. It's called The Visitation. I remember being in the car on the way to my sister's surprise funeral. In the back seat, I think. I can't imagine who was driving. At a stop sign, my head swiveled to a flicker in the roadside greenery, a fox poking its snout from between two bushes. I thought or I chose to think, that is my sister. That is my sister come back in animal form to tell me she's okay. It'll be okay. I'll be okay. But I was not okay. She was not okay. It would not be okay. I would not be okay for so long that when okay arrived, it couldn't place me. It looked right past the veil of shivering leaves, my long red snout, my gloved paws, swiping tears into my little black mouth. This is the last one I'll read from this collection and then I'll read a new one. Um, this one has, um, it has a vulgar word in the title, but I thought I'd tell you why I wrote it. I was at a reading in Oxford, Mississippi, where I live, and one of my friends was introducing the next reader, and the person he was introducing was his mentor. The, this man had taught him for many years and meant so much to him, and um, as this guy was introducing his mentor, he started to tear up, which I thought was adorable, but... Um, it embarrassed him, and he said, I can't believe I'm up here crying like a pussy. So in the days that that followed, I kept thinking about that word and, um, you know, why I objected to it, not even that it's vulgar, I have been known to swear, um, but that it seemed to me a bad metaphor. So I wrote this. What I think about when someone uses pussy as a synonym for weak at the deepest part of the deepest part, I rocked shut like a stone. I climbed as far inside me as I could. Husband, midwife, bedroom, world, quaint concepts. My eyes were clamshells. My ears were clapped shut by the palms of the dead. My throat was stoppered with bees. I was the fox caught in the trap, and I was the trap. 
chewing a leg off would have been easier than what I now required of myself. I understood I was alone in it. I understood I would come back from there with a the baby or I wouldn't come back at all. I was beyond the ministrations of loved ones. I was beyond the grasp of men. Even their prayers couldn't penetrate me. I did not fear death. Fear was an emotion and pain had scalded away all emotion. I chose. In order to come back from there with a the baby, I had to tear it out at the root. Understand, I did this without the aid of my hands. Um, and then I thought I'd read one new one, so this is the last thing I'll read, and then um, you know I'll just say thank you so much for being here. It's been so nice. Um, so since I've been in Leveny, I've been really blown away by the beauty of this town. Um, and every day when I go for my run, I'm, I'm astonished every day by how beautiful it is and how safe it feels. But even so, I've had a couple you know, strange thoughts and it makes me realize um, the power of our imagination and the narratives we tell ourselves, we're almost beholden to them. If you can have a, a scary thought in a place this beautiful and safe, um, what's the terrible power of our brain? So I wrote this. A woman's head is not the safest place to be. All it takes is a dark entryway. How we must turn our backs to face the tricky door the key not quite catching, jiggle, jiggle, to hear footsteps. We know what's next, the blow to the head, the white paneled van. Most men would never guess how often women are raped and murdered in their heads. A woman's head is not the safest place to be. Even here, in this Swiss village, in this stupidly beautiful Swiss village, ringed by fields that stretch to the lake. Even here, when I'm out for a run on the dirt paths between farms, all it takes is a large man stepping out of the wheat at the crest of the hill and striding toward me for it to begin. He will knock me into the hip-high waving wheat where my struggle will be disguised as more waving. He will gag me with golden tassels. He will wrap my braid around his fist and bang my skull into baked earth. And as the distance between us shrinks, I wonder if he will cart away my corpse or leave it for the vultures. And I've got nothing to drop to alert the dogs besides my wedding ring. And if I'm to be raped and murdered, I'd rather wear my wedding ring. It gets inside your head. Our culture gets inside your head where it makes you rape yourself, then murder yourself, then blame yourself after. When what the nice Swiss farmer says in passing is bonjour. Thank you so much. Thank you.